Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the 13th lecture of the MOOC course on Sociological Perspectives and Modernity. In the last lecture, I mean in the 12th lecture, we, we have started, we, we started with uh, ultra modernism, the structuralist case or the structuralist interpretation of critical modernist paradigm in sociology. I mean, we are trying to examine the structuralist, the structuralist interpretation of critical modernist paradigm in sociology against the backdrop of those four central pillars of modernity, central philosophical and political foundations of modernity, namely holism or totality, reflexivity, rationality and social movements. I keep on repeating these things precisely because it will be easier for, for the, the listener, the, the learner to understand this. Okay. In the last class, if you look at this, in the last class, we discussed how structuralism uh, uh, or structuralist interpretation of modernity can be examined through the works of Levi Strauss and Louis Althusser. Okay. Differences between or distinctions between Levi Strauss and Althusser can certainly be said to be critical in terms of their political positions, because Levi Strauss uh, was through and through a structural anthropologist, whereas Althusser was a neo Marxist. But how structure always arises out of out of their works is very important to be examined. Then, uh, we have also discussed how the, the intersectionality between structuralism uh, and, and, and uh, uh, structuralism on the one hand and positivism and functionalism on the other. Okay. Uh, then, when we, when we started discussing uh, structuralist interpretation of modernity through the lens of holism or totality, we have discussed how <coughs> structure always, always uh, or, or the proponents of structuralism always dwell upon the aspect of relationalism or the death of the subject or the death of the author. Okay. There, there we, we how we have discussed the distinction between uh, Weber and Marx initially. Okay. I mean, for Marx, the, the relational emphasis derives from a conception of the individual as essentially social in nature. And for Weber, what is relevant to, to a critical social species being is action, that is created towards the behavior of others. Okay? If you slightly recall the typology of social action. I mean traditional social action, affective or emotive social action, value rational social action or goal rational social action, okay? goal oriented social action, which is alternatively known as instrumental rationality. Okay? And for Weber, value rational social action and goal rational social action, they contribute to the domain of meaningful social action. Okay? In, in both cases, of Marx as well as Weber, structure arises out of social interaction, geared particularly towards uh, labor in Marx and towards meaning in Weber. Okay? I mean, when I say um, labor, okay, it is it is uh, it uh, it emanates from from a specific social and economic mode of production. Okay? 
when I say meaning in Weber, I mean meaning which is which arises out of social action, okay, namely value rational social action and goal rational social action. However, in structuralism, what we have discussed that relationship takes off and becomes fully independent, it is no longer human beings who relate with each other, but the fact of, of relationship which first creates the social and cultural individual out of an amorphous, uh, amorphous uh, biological mass. Okay? That is why we, we, we uh, have discussed, I mean in, in structuralism, we can only know the social, in other words the relational and that the individual or human nature are therefore, for structuralists are metaphysical concepts in the strict sense that we cannot know them. That is why I gave you this example that perhaps I do not know Lata Mangeshkar. As a person I do not know Lata Mangeshkar, but I know through, uh, through her performance, through her singing. Okay? It is only through their, through um, I mean uh, it is, uh, I mean what all we have available to us is our social interaction with, with Lata Mangeshkar, for example. What she says and what she does, this is ultra relationalism. In other words, leads to what is known by the slogan of the death of the subject or death of the author. Okay? It implies that either the individual literally does not exist because the individual is only created by social interaction and forms simply an intersection between different social relations or the individual is methodologically unknowable because we can only know the social. The individual is, is, uh, 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 is found in the world of unknowability, whereas the aspect of social can be found in the world of knowability, what we can know. Okay? Okay. The, the, the argument that the individual does not exist, that they are only the intersection of social relations or the bearers of social structure is argued very strongly by Louis Althusser, who sees our belief that we are individuals to be a psychological illusion. What, what, what Althusser argues? Althusser argues that the category of all uh, of, of the subject is the co constitutive category of all ideology. That is what we have discussed already. That is why our illusory subjectivity generates ideology and ideology reproduces our illusions of subjectivity. From, from difference, uh, I, mean, I, I mean from, from relationalism and death of the subject or death of the author. We have, we have also discussed difference. I mean all that we can know or all that exists is, uh, is uh, the relational. If all that we can know about is relations, then we can think about the way in which those relations interact with one another in a very detached or often, often very formalistic approach. Okay? I mean that is in, in this context we have, we have we have revisited Weber, Web, Weber's typology of social action. Okay? Um, then we have discussed, I mean what relationalism is likely to lead us to, in other words is a categorization of different types of relation as well as different levels of relation and an account of society in terms of the interaction of these different relations. This is very important not only types, but also levels of relation and how they interact with each other. So, so, relational approaches tend towards this kind of categorization, but they also tend to privilege intellectual consistency over, over empirical usefulness. Okay? We have discussed this. As we, as we generate more of these concepts describing types and levels of relations, uh, we are going to want to make them as consistent as possible with each other for very uh, valid intellectual reasons. I mean for equally valid, uh, uh, for equally valid intellectual reasons, uh, we are likely to want to be able to generate all of them from as restricted a number of basic concepts as possible. In other words, to generate typologies of possible variations and interrelations of particular types of relations. 
I mean the net effect of all these I mean I mean uh, the, 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 the entire gamut of uh, uh, structuralist accounts I mean accounts which derive all of social reality from the operation and permutation of a limited number of basic concepts. Okay? Uh, because this core concept which our description of society is generated okay, is a highly intellectual one, this is very likely to produce a form of philosophical idealism that we have discussed. I mean what is philosophical idealism? It is a theory which treats the social world as generated from ideas and in this case from a single idea okay, unlike Marx and Weber. For Marx and Weber, um, our social world is a product of a multiplicity of ideas. Okay, for for Weber, particularly for Weber, for for uh, Marx, it is not simply ideas. Rather, rather our social world is generated from from not ideas but matter. Okay, we have discussed this in materialist conception of history that matter is prior to the formation of ideas. Okay, but for structuralists our social world is a product of only single idea. Okay? I mean while there are dramatic differences in the content, the structure of our account of society is likely to be very similar whatever idea we start from. In some ways Althusser's account that not of actual modes of production, but of the idea of modes of production and Levi Strauss's account of culture oriented around culture oriented around difference produce quite similar ways of thinking. Okay? I mean that is how we have discussed how Levi Strauss for performs two operations in his account of human culture. I mean on the one hand Levi Strauss employs a linguistic analogy to treat culture not as not merely as a, as a system of relations, but as a system of symbolic relations namely myths. Okay? And on the other hand, using the same linguistic analogy, Levi Strauss um, aims at a purely formal description of the various elements uh, involved in particular myths. In, or, in other words, Levi Strauss sets out to describe structure, but not the content. Okay? Okay. Uh, then, where does the problem lie? I mean, what this leads to is an argument there is an objective meaning in human culture which is uh, different from the subject subjective meaning revealed by content. I mean there is a difference between structure and content and structuralists always try to look at the objective meaning in human culture re revealed by uh, uh, structure no, not the subjective meanings uh, subjective perceptions okay, which are revealed by the content. Okay. What 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 this objective meaning I mean which cannot be straightforwardly shown to be present in a particular myth or symbolic relation once we bracket any question of the way people say they understand it or the contexts that the, they, they, they tell it in it has to be located within the unconscious because the content is removed from that only structure remains for the for the proponents of structuralists. In other words, the, the uh, I mean from a from a description of social relations we move to a description of the nature of human psyche. Okay? What Levi Strauss claims to be the central feature of the human unconscious a claim which he believes to be backed up by linguists is naturally enough identical with the concept he uses to analyze the objective meaning of the form of myths. This concept is that of difference or distinction. For Levi Strauss, for Levi Strauss then the end of the intellectual journey is a description of uh, description of the of the social and and uh, in particular cultural world as a reflection of the supposed tendency of the human brain to divide things up. Okay? In this context you see we are still within within holism or totality in this context two more components are going to be covered in, in today's lecture that how uh, I mean both functionalism and modernity 
okay uh, they can also be be clubbed under uh, i mean they can also be examined when we examine structuralist interpretation of modernity through the lens of holism or totality okay now let us see what functionalism mm. what is that functionalism to just to start with what is functionalism in sociology functionalism refers to the idea of complementarity and reciprocity of roles in the social division of labor okay mm, it may be caste it may be race it may be gender whatever you look at or it may be class also okay in this in this social division of labor functionalism always argues for argues in favor of complementarity and reciprocity of roles okay i mean there is a problem with this approach suppose suppose marx said how can uh, social ch- I, mean, i mean how is social change possible marx said social change is possible through conflicts through class contradictions and so on. for for proponents of functionalism or structuralism okay no social change is possible only through mutual cooperation okay that's why the, the idea of complementarity and reciprocity of roles in the social division of labor was argued for by by the proponents of functionalism i mean there is a problem with with this approach and it is it is it is not just a uh, it is not just a difficulty with only levi strauss if we if we assume that the social world can be can be derived from an idea and not only an idea i mean a single idea i mean um uh, that that the idea of suppose if i say the idea of the not the actual mode of production but the idea of the capital uh, the idea of mode of production i mean in this case the idea of the capitalist mode of production or the idea of difference okay i mean the idea of not actual mode of production but the idea uh, i mean not the actual not the actual mode of production but the idea of mode of production which was seen in the works of althusser i mean the idea of difference or distinction uh, is seen through the works of levi strauss then in principle there is no possible explanation of how social change arises the world is divided up like this because it is identical with uh, the wage in which that particular uh, that particular uh, single idea is organized there is no reason why it should not change okay this is this is very important now of course now of course um, one can one can develop uh, um, ad hoc explanations uh, of any changes in the structure and in practice this is very often done this is a very often done i mean when you when you look at this if i if i say no only through mm, cooperation mutual uh, respect and so on we have uh, been able to make social change possible or development possible okay there is a problem i mean suppose how could indians build a new social order against colonialism it was not because of cooperation or mutual respect for each other but it was only through conflicts conflicts in terms of classes in terms of gender in terms of caste in terms of mm, uh, um, nationality and so on. okay i mean the imposition of western civilization on indian populace the, the the imposition of western development or mainstream development paradigms on india's populace the the imposition of slavery on india's populace okay that's why 
social change uh, that is why I said there is a problem, problem with this approach and it is not just a difficulty with and Levi Strauss, uh, I mean if we if you if we say that uh, if we assume that no social change has been made possible just because of such functionalist explanations, okay, I think there is that there, there, there are certain problems. Okay. Then then that is why I said um, the world is divided up like this because it is identical with the way the idea is organized and there is no reason why it should not change. Another, I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, one can one can develop ad hoc explanations of any changes in the structure, and in practice, this is very often done. Another possibility is to develop a typology of different possible types of society, so that change is simply change from one way of expressing the idea to another. A more interesting and widely used approach, however, is what is known as functional explanations. What are these then, uh, if I say these are functional explanations, what do we mean by functional explanations? I mean functional explanations are, are explanations of events, okay? not of their causes, but of their effects. What causes this? Okay, functionalists don't tend to explain. Functionalists always try to explain in terms of only effects. For example, uh, we might explain the fall of a government. Suppose colonial government to to Indian government, British colonial government to Indian government. We are, I mean, a structuralist will not be explaining this in terms of events which led up to it, but, but where a functionalist will be more interested in, I mean in terms of what it led to. That is why I, I, I repeat for example, we might explain the fall, fall of a government not in terms of the events which led up to, but in terms of what it led to. Okay? I, I mean I can say that uh, uh, how Indians uh, fought against the British. We must examine the nature of events okay, that, that led up to an, an anti-colonial uh, social and political movements in India that led to such anti-colonial uh, movements. But I just do not look at uh, 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 only uh, this is uh, only in terms of two events this is colonialism and this is Indian government, British led colonial government as well and, and then Indian political government, political state. Okay? That is why it is very important to, 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 to look at any any change in terms of the events which led up to it. In there the proponents of functionalism committed a, a grave error that, that they did not look at uh, the, the, the social and political changes, economic changes in terms of the events which, which led up to it, but in terms of what it led to. On the face of it this is simply unacceptable. The rules of logic do not the rules of any any substantive argument, okay? they do not allow us to reverse the flow of causality and say that an event A can be caused by an event B which has not yet happened. This form of explanation which is known as teleological uh, can only make sense in one of two contexts. Okay? Teleological I mean where I do not know. Uh, what is the cause and what is the effect? I just know what is the effect. Okay? Uh, let me let me give you a few more examples. I mean, one is, uh, I mean, I mean, in in one of two contexts when I say, uh, I mean, this kind of functional explanation, uh, which is known as teleological explanation, can only make sense in one of two contexts. I mean, one is if event A is caused by a prior event alpha. 
for example, which is somebody's intention with regard to the future. We can certainly argue that a government fell because someone wanted to form a different government and thus forced the collapse of the current government. Okay? Okay? Nevertheless, nevertheless, intention, nevertheless, intention and, and effect are two different things. I mean purpose and objective, I mean purpose and, and uh, I mean intention when I say motive okay? and effect, I mean desired result, okay? they, are, they, they are two different things. The intention to bring about event B may not in fact be realized and our action in causing event A may have completely different results. This is generally characterized as unintended consequences. It is an it is a Weberian term, okay. Unintended consequences are un, unanticipated consequences. And it is clear from Weber's account of goal oriented social action or instrumental rationality as a method we adapt as a means to a particular goal, but but which then becomes an end in itself. So, an intentional or purposive explanation can only work where the person with the intention is in fact not just all powerful, but has total knowledge of the context of their action. In other words, where they are God. Much medieval thought is teleological in this sense, events are explained in terms of God's plans or supernatural forces. Okay. That is why uh, uh, I mean for the future of the world, I mean that is what theological stage suggested that 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 social change occurs because of supernatural forces. Okay. Uh, this is very important, I mean that is why an intentional explanation can only work where the person with the intention is in fact not just all powerful, but has total knowledge of the context of their action. Okay. I mean in this sense. Uh, uh, all I mean I mean medieval thought uh, provided us uh, with with uh, uh, provided such such teleological or functional explanations in this sense. I mean events were always explained in terms of some uh, supernatural forces for the future of the world. Okay. Apart from intentional explanations, there is one other form of uh, potentially valid explanation in terms of effects, which is the argument known as functionalism. It is represented for example, by the claim that such and such thing happens because the economy needs it, because of the interests of capital and today the proponents of neoliberalism also do this that no our economy needs it, our, 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 uh, our, uh, it, it is in the best interests of capital flows. Okay. Please note, note this that, that this is quite different from an explanation in terms of the perceived needs of the economy as seen by the government, by the, by the electors uh, or by individual managers. It is also different from a simple explanation in terms of compatibility. Okay. I mean when I say compatibility, I mean by definition if a form of state is incompatible with a form of economic organization, they will not ex coexist. Okay? I mean uh, uh, the, the, the nature of the state must be designed in, in such a way that it must have some kind of compatibility with its economic, social and political organizations. But when I, when I mention this, I do not, I mean, I, mean I, I do not say anything about the reasons for their incompatibility or the mechanism which prevents their uh, coexistence. Okay. I mean strict functionalist explanations are based on an uh, analogy to Darwinian evolutionary theory. This argues in terms of competition for survival in a, in a situation of relative scarcity, I mean principle of natural selection, okay. the origin of species I am referring to, the evolution of species I am ref referring to. Okay. That is why we always try to argue in terms of I mean, we I, when I say I mean not we as such, but but the proponents of functionalism, uh, uh, the proponents uh, of uh, the 
not simply Darwinian evolutionary theory, but but the proponents of of functionalist interpretation of Darwinian evolutionary theory that which argues in terms of competition for survival in a situation of relative scarcity. Over immense periods of time, genetic mutations and variations will occur. Some of these will be functional for survival in the sense that they will either enable the new individual to survive more effectively or to breed uh, more effectively. I mean uh, people very often say that um, why human species though we are, we are uh, relatively uh, physically weak as compared to a dinosaur for example, why, why we did not lose out I mean why, why, why we did not cease to exist or we have not yet ceased to exist. Uh, uh, rather, rather dinosaurs are such big, huge uh, uh, species. They were subject to extinction. Why? It people attribute it to reasoning capacity. People, uh, but 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 Darwin made two very two two very important uh, uh, remarks, um, scientific remarks that uh, that one is adaptability. Okay. That, that the new individual I mean that uh, which enables us the enables the new individual to survive one is adaptability um, in a given topographic geographic uh, uh, cultural uh, natural environment okay one and secondly the capacity uh, for reproduction okay the capacity for uh, uh, the capacity to reproduce further generations. Okay. That is why to breed more effective from, from, the, from the point of view of genetic reproduction of course, what matters is that a plant or animal survives long enough to, to reproduce itself. The better its statistical chances to of survival to this point or the more successful it is at reproduction, the more individuals with this different genetic structure there will be. Over time, okay, putting it succinctly over time functional mutations will, will tend to reproduce themselves and spread less functional mutations will survive less frequently given the competition for the same food and so on I mean principle of natural selection and will be outclassed in terms of reproduction. Okay. That is very important. Okay. Uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, such such argument uh, doesn't hold uh, uh, good for social explanations, though. Okay, I said natural uh, principle of natural selection. Okay, uh, explanations were based on on the basis of changes in nature, but this argument may not hold good for social explanations. I mean, explanations for for social change for three very important reasons. Firstly, it assumes fixed units such as individual animals. In other words, its natural affinity is with a radical methodological individualism which takes the individual or some other unit perhaps the family or the enterprise not just as the starting point, but effectively as the only reality which does not examine for example, the social origins of the individual's way of thinking and definition of needs uh, uh, and which does not consider the possibility of interaction between for example, the individual and, and the family. Okay. Secondly, it, it assumes that whatever the unit is, it has a means of self reproduction which is as exact as as uh, as exact uh, and as stable as genetic transmission obviously enough however even when farms copy successful farms they do not reproduce all features of the successful farms and they cannot all they do is import what they perceive to be the important features what i what i uh, tell you you do not copy me what you tell me, I do not simply copy you. I perceive what is important for me. 
you perceive what is important for you right. So, we can think of a general diffusion for example, of instrumental rationality which is intentional in nature goal oriented social action. I mean people think that it is likely to be effective and it, it happens that they are right, but we cannot say that this is a functional process rather an intentional process, porpoisic process. The, the continuing history of Anglo American interest in Japanese management methods is a sufficient is an adequate example of this. Japanese management is not a single fixed entity like a collection of genes, but is transmitted as a series of what may be very differing assumptions about its key elements. Just as importantly Anglo American workers and managers and Japanese workers and managers have different cultural backgrounds. If our cultures, cultural backgrounds differ, then then our strategies will differ, our, our management style will differ. So, that the assumption that the form is a unit which is not influenced by other social realities falls. Okay? The form is also a social reality. And and thirdly, uh, and and thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, okay, not only do we not have straightforward units and not only can they not produce themselves in a uh, in a simple fashion, but we have to say that the Darwinian argument of the survival of the fittest can only be a metaphoric one when it is applied to society. We could not live like that even if we felt it was desirable that survival of the fittest okay? that that the, the 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 transmission i mean the the transition from changes in biology to to changes in our economic culture and polity perhaps perhaps this this such uh, such compatibility will is not uh, uh, i mean such compatibility um, uh, does not hold good okay doesn't stand the litmus test this can be seen very clearly at the level of societies. I mean contemporary societies are not disputing a common uh, living space. In fact, the economically dominant societies are experiencing a population decline. More generally, conflict between contemporary societies is only very rarely expansionist. Even where it is, it is generally a matter of the imposition of a new form of government but not of the obliteration of the previously existing society. Even where this is the case as for example, in, in the population movements of the migration period around the fall of the Roman empire, functionality is a fairly ambigu uh, ambiguous concept. The societies which ex expanded into the declining Roman empire for example, were not in general technologically superior. Uh, to, to the Romans or even necessarily economically superior. Then what was that? In fact, their need to migrate may be seen as an evidence of the problems they, that they experienced in maintaining their way of life in the regions they originated from. Okay? Uh, their superiority was partly demographic and partly military. In other words, functionality in these terms is almost entirely destructive and tells us very little about features of economic or social organizations in the context of critical modernist paradigm in sociology. Then what about then what about mm, the structuralist interpretation of modernity itself? Okay. How does radical relationalism? I mean I have I have I have discussed what we have discussed, we have discussed how radical relationalism leads to structuralism as a holistic account of society and also indicate okay, uh, or and also indicated the well known difficulty that structuralism has with explaining change. Okay. The last feature of holism or totality that is worth mentioning here is the concept of modernity expressed in structural. Okay. I mean this will be uh, briefly uh, though because because while while structuralism is strongly modernist in its approach it doesn't treat modernity as a key term it is itself modern but it is not very interested in the specificity of the modern there are obvious reasons for this i mean if if 
society consists of a structure of relations deriving from a single key concept, single idea. Okay? It is hard to see how we can have dramatically different types of society. Okay? That is why though, 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 though the proponents of structuralism or, or structuralism itself is, 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 is a highly modernist approach, it, it, does, it does not treat modernity as a key term. It is in fact, it is itself modern, but it does not I mean it is not very much interested in the in the specificity of the elements which uh, which constitute um, uh, the idea of being modern okay? Okay. that 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 is very important. Okay. The, this is the I mean this is a problem uh, for Levi Strauss who derives the the organization of of culture from the biological structure of the unconscious brain. In other words, from something which if it changes at all does so over, emer, uh, over enormously long periods, of, long periods of time. Not surprisingly though, Levi Strauss's work as was at the time the general practice among anthropologists was largely devoted to the study of what were seen as traditional societies and he and Levi Strauss's concept of the modern is largely defined against this. Okay. To, 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 to an extent it appears that Levi Strauss uh, treats the modern as an aberration, an unnatural separation of culture and nature and doomed to destruction for that reason okay. by, by bringing about a critique to, to modernity. I mean, what is what is what is uh, so important about about being modern for Levi Strauss? No, it is not important. To some extent, he 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 treats the modern as an aberration. It is a deviant from the way we conceptualize nature, uh, individual nature as as species being. It is it is not a natural separation. This this separation between culture and nature is not not and naturally separated i mean i mean not, not naturally mediated rather it is an unnatural separation of culture and nature and hence doomed to destruction for that reason that's why modernity cannot thrive this may be appealing as a political position but it does not really deal with the problem and later structuralists have tried to show that modern culture can also be analyzed in the terms that levi strauss uses for traditional culture. This is one part. On the other hand, Althusser by, by, by contrast fits modernity into a static typology, I mean unchanging typology in which it is effectively simply one variant of on a pattern. This derives from his uh, 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 version of uh, Marxism which replaces the crude version of economic determinism found in vulgar Marxism. Let me put it this way that Marx never said this, uh, that uh, uh, I mean the crude distinction between economic and non-economic institutions, it is only when uh, uh, people try to misconstrue Marxism that people say that no Marx said only economic uh, uh, um, considerations should be made, but it is not true. Uh, that is why I used this term that, that, that uh, if everything is determined by economy, Marx never said this. Okay? Um, rather, Marx was trying more towards base and superstructure model uh, and there also his, his analysis of, of economic and other, other uh, social institutions was more philosophical, okay? not economic as such. Okay? That, that his, his, the way he tried to treat political economy was a part of his philosophical investigations. Okay? The argument that everything else can, I mean when I say economic determinism, I mean everything else can simply be reduced to the economic considerations with a more sophisticated analysis of different levels of social life, including the economic, the political and the ideological. Each of these for, for Althusser can be described as 
relatively autonomous. In other words, it has a logic of its own and cannot simply be reduced to the economy. Okay? This is very important. I mean, with a with a um, with a more sophisticated analysis analysis of of uh, the I mean the the way uh, Althusser tried to do this. I mean, I mean, it's very important to to uh, place economic, political, ideological, and so on uh, on equal parlance. Okay, uh, not on a higher pedestal vis-a-vis -vis others. Okay. They, this they, that is why it is very important. Okay. Um, okay. There, thus, thus, thus Althusser's model of the social totality or social holism is that of a decentered whole, that nothing centers only on the economic, but, but political, ideological factors they also shape our economy. Okay. That is why that is why uh, Althusser's model of the, so of the social reality is that of a decentered whole. Nevertheless, the economic, the economic is, is determinant in the last instance for, for Althusser. In other words, it has the final say. Since the last instance for, for Althusser, on what is that last instance? No, last instance never comes. Only we have this idea about the last instance the way he said there is nothing called actual mode of production but but the idea about idea of mode of production okay that's why since since the last instance never comes though it is the interaction between the economic political and ideological which is most important incidentally this tension between determination in the last instance and the insistence that the last instance never comes is one of the major theoretical problems of Althusser's holism or totality. Determination by the by the economic level expresses itself primarily in the creation of these separate levels and the prioritizing of one or the other at different historical periods. In other words, within a given mode of production, it is the economic level which determines which level is dominant in a more immediate sense. Okay. For example, in feudalism, the political and ideological levels are dominant. In capitalism, it is the economic level which is uh, economic level itself which is dominant. In both cases, however, the, the economic level is ultimately determinant. In other words, it determines whether it will itself be dominant or whether some other level will be. It is the economic which is going to determine. This makes, I mean, uh, uh, what does it refer to? This makes a certain kind of sense. I mean, the economic, for, for our purpose, for these for these purposes, can be thought of in terms of the relations of ownership and control. In feudalism, the landlord owns the land, but the peasant controls their agricultural production. So, the appropriation of the peasant surplus production by the nobility does not take place within the actual process of production, but as an effect of political or ideological structures which guarantee this transfer. On the, on the contrary, in capitalism, the, the means of production are both owned and controlled by the capitalist, thus the appropriation of surplus value takes place within the process of production. The society is therefore said to be dominated by the economy. For Althusser, in other words, the, the difference between modern and other societies is that the, the that they represent different possible arrangements of of uh, of um, uh, uh, the ownership and control situation. In this way, structuralism is unable to do anything very interesting with the idea of modernity or indeed of social change more generally. It tends to reduce history either to uh, a contingent change without any real meaning or to variations on a theme. That is why there is the, 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 you will find the absence of content only structure is becoming more important. Okay. In, I mean in this lecture in, in the last I mean in the 12th and the 13th lectures. 
I mean these in these two lectures, we have covered the structuralist interpretation of critical modernist paradigm against the framework of holism or totality. Okay. In, in the next lecture, we are going to discuss uh, structuralist interpretation of uh, uh, modernity through, through the lens of to start with social movements, uh, rationality. Uh, I mean, when I say social movements, I mean ideology and function, uh, political background, I mean what kind of there is no one Marxism, but there are uh, uh, I mean in, in the structuralist case, there are two Marxisms, okay, okay, but there are multiple Marxisms that we see today. Okay. Then, then we will also uh, see uh, I mean under, under social movements, we will see uh, ideology and function and the two Marxisms, I mean the political background. In rationality, we are going to discuss the meaning of science. In reflexivity, we will discuss Levi Strauss's uncertainty principle. Uh, I mean in the next lecture we are going to cover. Okay? Thank you.